Our next speaker is Dr. Mark Stewart, who is an MD-PhD graduate of SUNY Downstate's class of 1991. So it's his 25th reunion. He is Dean of the School of Graduate Studies at SUNY Downstate, Vice Dean for Research in the SUNY Downstate College of Medicine, and Professor of Physiology and Pharmacology and Neurology. He was awarded the Downstate Chapter of AOA Alumni Membership in 2014 and has over 60 publications in journals such as Epilepsia, Cardiology, Journal of Neurophysiology, Hippocampus, and the Journal of Comparative Neurology. He has been grant funded by the NIH and has developed two SUNY networks of excellence in brain and health. Um, and he's also the Brooklyn site director of the New York Academy of Sciences after school mentoring program, which brings young SUNY scientists to middle schools to improve math and science literacy of Brooklyn's children. He has been a mentor to many students and residents at Downstate, and today he's going to speak to us about his research on the causes and consequences of seizures. We welcome him as he celebrates his 25th reunion year, and his talk will be on the, an explanation for sudden death and epilepsy. Dr. Stewart. Thank you. This is quite an honor to be asked to present here uh, to this group of alumni. Uh, in, in following with Dr. Kleppel's uh, first talk, I'll uh, recall Chandler Brooks, uh, who was uh, <laughs> the founding dean of the School of Graduate Studies, the first dean. I'm the fourth, um, and my two degrees of separation from me to Brooks is Kiyomi Koizumi, who was uh, chair of physiology, who hired me and still in many ways is an active mentor for me. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is sort of the punchline of a bunch of experiments that we've been doing over about eight years now, where we've been exploring autonomic, cardiovascular, and respiratory consequences of epileptic seizures in a rat model. The goal being the most severe consequence, uh, death, and that is termed sudden death in epilepsy. And on the screen are two published definitions for sudden death, uh, published in the same year, sharing essentially many of the same features, that a sudden death in epilepsy case is defined by a sudden and unexpected death that's not traumatic, not drowning. If you had a seizure and crashed your car, that's not sudden death in epilepsy. Um, <clears throat> In fact, a critical weakness of the entire uh, exploration of sudden death is that the diagnoses are labeled such only when there's uh, nothing on a post-mortem examination to point to the cause of death. When there is, the death gets labeled by that cause and pulled out of the sudden death category. And so what we're left to look at is a, a mixture of things that many people really haven't quite understood how to approach. So <clears throat> the general thinking is that a seizure is essential to trigger some set of events that ends in death within a short period of time. Uh, the natural mechanism for linking an abnormal brain electrical activity pattern to the heart or a respiration is obviously the autonomic nervous system. And it's clear from various kinds of data that respiratory derangements are uh, just as potentially important as cardiovascular. Uh, but that's where we sat for a long time. And what I'm going to propose is actually a, a more or less definitive description of potential outcomes um, with some prioritization of what those outcomes uh, are likely to show up in, in an epilepsy patient. So my path to where we end up starts from some work that I did as a graduate student at Downstate, and what's illustrated here at the bottom is a normal synchronous activity pattern recorded from an area of brain called hippocampus. And the hippocampus is notorious for learning and memory, uh, but the same features that confer the ability to learn on a cortical structure put it at risk for electrical activity that's abnormal, namely seizure activity. 
Now, we studied this normal activity pattern in animals that were anesthetized with a drug called urethane. And so it took a little bit of time, but we came to the uh, idea that we might try exploring seizure activity in animals that were anesthetized with urethane. The result is that we were able to get beautiful seizure activity using a chemical convulsant, canic acid, which is a glutamate receptor agonist. And <clears throat> the remarkable feature of urethane is that the animals don't show motor convulsions, but they do show the seizure activity in hippocampus. It just does not spread rostrally to neocortical areas to activate motor cortex. It does spread caudally through hypothalamus and brainstem. So we have an anesthetized animal that's not convulsing, showing limbic cortical seizure activity just like temporal lobe epileptic patients with the full set of hypothalamic, medullary, autonomic, cardiovascular, and respiratory changes associated with seizure activity. So this enables us to instrument the animals in a variety of ways and make recordings during seizure activity of a, a large number of parameters, many of which I'll show you here, uh, to get to the full set of consequences. So the entire story is on the screen here. This is basically everything that can happen to you as a result of a seizure. We'll spend our time talking about the bottom, the punchline, <clears throat> but the first points that I'll make with a slide like this is that what's clear through our work and others is that when a seizure occurs, it very strongly activates uh, regions of hypothalamus and medulla to increase the activity of both sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. Each seizure will increase the activity in both divisions. What you see as an outcome in terms of a bradyarrhythmia or a tachyarrhythmia depends on the relative patterns and amounts of activity in those two subdivisions. In most cases, what happens is the seizure activates those two divisions. You have some cardiac uh, derangement that's evident. Uh, in ma many cases, it's a mild tachycardia. The seizure ends, the stimulus for the autonomic derangement goes away, and you recover. <clears throat> In a somewhat more extreme case, the parasympathetic division can be activated to a degree that you would produce a condition of asystole. In that case, the cardiac output drops essentially to zero, the brain blood flow decreases, the seizure stops because it's not supported by brain blood flow, the stimulus for the autonomic derangement goes away, and again you come back to baseline. So for the first I don't know, three, four years when we were looking at things, we were under the impression that there was no way a seizure could kill you. <clears throat> Something else had to happen. And one of the examples that people have thought about is as a result of your convulsion, perhaps you go face down in the pillow of your bed and because of uh, the derangements in muscle movements, a postictal depression where you're not moving very well, even after the seizure, you basically suffocate. That was one option, and I'll explain some of those things in a bit. But what I want to talk about are two possible ways that we can get to death. The first we started to look at was perhaps the seizure can produce a tachyarrhythmia, a ventricular tachycardia that would even devolve into ventricular fibrillation. At that point, even if the seizure stopped because of the cardiac output collapsing, uh, you're going to expire unless there's resuscitation. Uh, and then the last step we'll, we'll come to. So first, this bit on whether or not a seizure might elicit an episode of ventricular fibrillation. And we spent a great deal of time looking at ways to manipulate the physiology in order to get here. And the answer is that you can get there uh, in a manner of speaking. Um, with a set of conditions that are hard to configure exactly the right way. The three conditions are a near absence of parasympathetic tone. Uh, the vagus is a very protective nerve. And so what we were doing is in many cases actually completely uh, 
uh, eliminating vagal input to the heart by cutting the vagus nerve. You need a sympathetic activation, and we were using isoproteranol, and the doses of isoproteranol needed to be above the doses that you would use to get to a maximal heart rate. So we're actually probably crossing over uh, the beta receptor activation uh, and likely producing uh, ischemic events in the heart itself. And you needed to reduce the systemic oxygen uh, to a certain level and exactly the right level. In this graph to the right, we're showing the oxygen saturation on the y-axis the cases where we were able to initiate ventricular fibrillation had an oxygen saturation change that was just right. Too fast and too deep, you produce a non-sinus bradycardia. Not deep enough, you just develop a slight sinus bradycardia. Just wrong gives you uh, the conversion to ventricular fibrillation. This is exemplified here to the bottom left where normal sinus rhythm essentially spontaneously converts to a short run of VTAC and then VFib uh, under this set of three conditions that are properly configured. The interesting thing here, and what you see to the right, is us restoring vagal activity uh, with a high-frequency vagus stimulus. And when we do that, what you see here is a 50 hertz vagus train. We actually convert the VFib back to a normal sinus rhythm. That's actually the basis for a device that we have uh, that solves all of the problems of the current ICD device in terms of lead failure and things like that. So uh, this is a device that's just developing. Uh, in fact, I learned yesterday we got a small grant to move this out of the valley of death into some light of day to uh, potentially get this to market. <clears throat> the closest we could actually get to having a seizure or some conditions that you would see in a seizure trigger ventricular fibrillation is this example of vagus nerve overactivity from stimulation. I've suppressed the shock artifacts here. That's part of what we needed to do for the device. So <clears throat> the run of VFib starts up at the top. You can see the blood pressure collapse here. And in the second sweep, there's a flurry of uh, beats, uh, ventricular tachycardia here. If we imagine the vagus stimulus had stopped somewhere in the middle of this run of VTAC, I would expect this might spontaneously convert from there to VFib. But because the vagus stimulus continues, uh, the heart's actually protected from that happening. But this is the closest we've been able to come to having uh, parasympathetic storm essentially produce a cardiac change in terms of its own blood supply that leads to VTAC and potentially VFib. So I think VFib is a possibility, but it's not a common possibility. In fact, if we look at animals that are epileptic with the idea that repeated seizures may actually produce a, a heart that has a greater sensitivity to VFib, the opposite is actually true. Epileptic hearts are enlarged, but in fact the dilation is an, uh, it's an eccentric type of hypertrophy, which means the heart's enlarged, but the walls are not thickened. And so our thinking is that the actual path length for the electrical conduction in the heart is longer and makes it more resistant to re-entrant type arrhythmias. The real action is here where We've been looking for a way in which we could produce a period of much more severe hypoxia as a way of getting us to death. And so we started a collaboration with otolaryngologists, developed a laryngoscope for the rat, and you see our first Home Depot uh, tin version of that laryngoscope, a more sophisticated version made by a machinist in our department. Uh, and to the far right is an image of the airway of a rat with the retinoid cartilages at the bottom of this uh, cross-shaped structure here and vocal folds at the top. And with this kind of imaging, we can plot the movement of the tips of the retinoid cartilage and so we can essentially track the opening and closing of each half of the airway. This example shows 
uh, a left side that's remaining intact and a right side that's been paralyzed after crushing the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, so we have a sensitive measure of tracking what's happening in the airway during a seizure. So these are the first real descriptions of what's happening to the airway during a seizure. Um, <clears throat> and we can do this again because the animal is not convulsing. And what you see in the top in blue are the normal movements toward and away from the midline by the tip of the arytenoid cartilage. And in red, abnormal movements that occur during a seizure. Now, two things characterize the red, or three things. The first is that their respiratory rate is higher. The second is that even though the rate is higher, these are not synchronized. If you actually look at the retinoid cartilages uh, on video, uh, my postdoc describes it as them shaking. <clears throat> but the airway is mostly open. It's not entirely open. It's at least partially open. When we look at flow volume loops from plethysmography during seizure activity, the top is an animal that's uh, unintubated and pre-seizure. Uh, to the right is intubated and pre-seizure. Five minutes of recording and you see that the fairly stable flow volume loop shapes. In the bottom, you see intubated to the right, unintubated to the left, flow volume loops during seizures, where the predominant activity during this recording episode was seizure activity. <clears throat> the overall appearance of these curves show that the flow volume loop variability is quite a bit greater, uh, but when you look at the shift of inspiratory to expiratory flows in the non-intubated animals, that shift is characteristic of an extra extra thoracic airway obstruction, again, consistent with partial airway occlusion. That's not gonna be a cause of death. So we started to make recordings of recurrent laryngeal nerve and to look a bit deeper. And this is an example of an animal that was recorded with a window cut in its trachea. <clears throat> and during that time, we're recording from recurrent laryngeal nerve in green, EEG is shown in blue, so a seizure is progressing and stops. And what you see in the recurrent laryngeal nerve is normal burst firing associated with each breath, uh, but an increase in activity, in including the recruitment of new firing new units, uh, gets to be quite strong at this point, and then calms back down before the seizure is over, suggesting very intense uh, laryngeal activity. When you actually look at the airway during these episodes, the airway is completely closed from laryngospasm. So we have a seizure-induced storm, essentially, on the recurrent laryngeal nerve that produces a complete airway closure, obstructive apnea that's illustrated here in the top on our plethysmography records, a significant change in the EKG. You can see this shift up which is basically, if you swept that out, ST elevation in the EKG, very quickly we get hypoxic changes in the EKG. The seizure stops, these become artifacts, uh, seizure is here. <clears throat> in these animals, there are also episodes of central apnea, meaning there's no evidence of the animal attempting to breathe. Here's one example where the plethysmograph is showing an abrupt cessation of breathing. During that time, there's no change in the EKG, no change in the EEG. This is a different example where we're showing the EEG, recurrent laryngeal nerve during this storm, the laryngospasm associated with that. Significant changes in the EKG are highlighted here. <clears throat> in contrast, no change at all in the central apnea cases. Interestingly, in the seizure-induced central apnea episodes, the airway is open, uh, so it's held actively in an open state. We actually think this is very similar to what you would observe in the case of someone just holding their breath, uh, <clears throat> as opposed to somebody where you're covering their face and they can't breathe, two very different experiences. And so the, the critical aspect in terms of physiology deteriorating is this laryngospasm. <clears throat>
as a way of exploring the airway obstruction with a bit more precision, we simulate the airway obstruction uh, from laryngospasm by just closing the airway. And during these episodes, we're recording the force generated by the animal as it attempts to inspire during the closed airway. And you can see that force progressively increase. <clears throat> These are snapshots of M-mode echocardiograms showing a dilation of the left ventricle and a, essentially a failure to pump by the time the animal arrests. And with this model, we can very precisely tell the point of respiratory arrest. So in terms of a sequence of events, we can identify uh, very accurately the timing from the onset of a complete occlusion to the point of respiratory arrest. This is a summary of some of those examples where uh, from the point of occlusion, which is the second point, uh, the heart rate is dropping, the respiratory rate is slowing down, the effort to inspire increases, it goes to zero when that effort stops. Uh, <clears throat> so a lot of variables that we have a good understanding of. What's interesting about the autonomic response to the airway occlusion is that it's in the same direction as the autonomic changes induced by the seizure activity in the first place. Uh, this slide illustrates cardiac sympathetic activity before a seizure, during very strong seizure activity uh, induced by canic acid, and then the additional increase uh, induced by, in this case, turning off a mechanical ventilator on an animal that had uh, its chest cavity open to expose cardiac sympathetic nerves. So the, the combination of what started with the seizure and what continues with the airway obstruction looked to us like a very uh, good series of events that would lead you from seizure to death. Uh, right now, we have a paper in review it's in its sixth month after only two revisions by us. Uh, and the main problem is this report, which is a paper published in Lancet Neurology describing the results of something called the Mortimus study. <clears throat> and what you see here is a summary of 10 cases. And the key thing is the dark blue bar at the end of each of these lines. That dark blue bar at the end of each of those lines is the point that the investigators have identified something they call terminal apnea. And for them, terminal apnea is occurring sometime after the seizure ends. The seizure ends in their recordings here to the left. So when we talk about seizure-induced obstructive apnea, what we get from the reviewers is the apnea doesn't occur until after the seizure is over. Their evidence that the apnea is occurring after the seizure is over comes from records that they've obtained from the epilepsy monitoring unit, which is a simple EEG and usually one or two EKG leads, essentially a rhythm strip. When you look at those recordings, there are these artifacts in the records that are clear indications of some type of respiratory effort. So in their study, Whenever they have these, they're concluding that the individual is still breathing until they stop seeing them, at which point they label it terminal apnea. <clears throat> so we've been repeatedly asked to comment on this, so we, we did. And what you see is an example of a, a seizure experiment. The animal here is in a seizure. We've induced an airway occlusion, and you see these deflections indicating intense effort to inspire during a completely sealed airway. And what you see, filtered in exactly the same way the investigators did on the EEG, so extracted from here up, or from the EKG, extracted in the same way down, artifacts in the record that look like breathing. Only I know the animal's not breathing. The animal's trying to breathe, and that's a very different story from actually breathing. In fact, these artifacts are really great during this massive effort to breathe 
and not so good when it's easy to breathe. So the best evidence of artifacts, in our opinion, is occurring when the animal or human is actually obstructed. This is another example where we've turned, this animal was ventilated or hyperventilated, <clears throat> and we stopped the ventilator, so we suppressed his natural drive to breathe, stop the ventilator, the animal starts trying to breathe, but since the system is closed, that effort increases, and you see the same type of artifacts here. <clears throat> the neat thing is we have a second biomarker, the first biomarker being these artifacts, which are beautifully correlated in their size to the amplitude of the attempt to breathe. The second biomarker is illustrated here in black, the RR interval is plotted as a function of time, and what you see is tiny variation in the RR interval, and then the variance blows up. This is all during the occlusion. If you look at the relation of the RR interval to the peak effort to inspire, the normal pattern of RR interval lengthening during the effort to inspire is shown in the top we get to very short intervals only during these intense attempts to breathe, not during the first part of the obstruction and even not during a missed breath late in the obstruction. So our second biomarker is not only do you have the artifact, but if you see very short RR intervals associated with one of those artifacts, it's highly likely that you're late in an airway obstruction. And when you look at the Mortimus data itself, short intervals are evident in association with these artifacts. <clears throat> so we think Mortimus got it wrong that the patients were actually in seizure-induced laryngospasm, which produced obstructive apnea before the seizure stopped. The seizure eventually does stop, and what they're calling terminal apnea is actually the point of respiratory arrest, something we can very precisely define. So that's our summary, uh, and the key is reaching that point of respiratory arrest. If you get to that point of respiratory arrest, the game is over unless somebody resuscitates you. <clears throat> so I've talked about our two biomarkers the alternative mechanism for, v, uh, for SUDEP mainly being uh, ventricular fibrillation. Uh, and interestingly, in the fibrillation example, we, we wrote a review on this. There are three cases published, and we were told by the editor there's a fourth case. And actually, when we looked at that fourth case, it was a person who came in in asystole, got whacked with atropine, which is step number one for us, got whacked with epinephrine, which is step number two, and had his own issues with hypoxia, and so he's a living example of our pharmacological experiment. The nice thing is now we have an animal model that allows us to rather aggressively test manipulations that can be used to intervene if somebody starts one of these episodes of obstructive apnea or to potentially prevent them. So, that's where I'll stop. This is the a partial list of the collaborators we have here and uh, in Japan. And thank you very much for your attention.